There are no distinctions here. There are distinctions here. So we go to parts. But you can just talk about it roughly as divisible and indivisible. But you can't cut this up into parts, but that's the language that some translators use. It should be that which is without distinction, that which is with distinction. Okay. So we play. Nine? Agree? Now, uh, now, the riddle, all right? Here we have soul. And here's the task. Can we explain in some way how this world soul, as it were, enters in the body? That's the problem of the incarnation of the soul in the body, right? See, he's got two problems. He has making sense of this, and also the opposite. How does the soul escape and leave the body, and how can it do that? Those are the two goals he has. And that, of course, is the yoga and the phaedo, called purification or the true philosopher, the true philosopher's task. Uh, it's not purification, that which we have mentioned many times in our dialogue about the process of separating the soul from the body. When the soul is said to be spread throughout the body, collecting it all together, it's the habit of doing that again and again, such that you can then bring it together in a unity independent of the body so that it can exist alone by itself. Right? Phaedo, right? Okay. Where is it? For those of you, right? Six, between 60, it's set very clearly at 68, right? 69. Therefore we read, right? Now we must ask, how soul comes to be in body? What is the manner? What's the process? Ah, this is worth pondering and inquiring into. Well, there are two ways to enter the body. Well, the first is the soul is already embodied to change bodies. It's already there. See, in one sense, we do not agree. If world soul is spread throughout the cosmos and there's a body, it's already got it. So he's going to criticize the, u the use of physical language for philosophical purposes. So that's where we're going. Okay. For instance, to pass from a body of air or fire to one of earth. If people do not call this a simple change of bodies, it is because the body from which it comes to enter into, right, the earthly body remains invisible. The second way is for a soul after an existence in which it was never embodied, never embodied, to pass into some body or another. Oh, then that's like a, we can call that the virgin soul, right? Never entered into a body before. For the first time, the soul forms a relationship with body. In this second case, it is, advis it is advisable to examine what happens when a soul that is completely pure and free from body takes a bodily nature into itself. That's his task. That's where we're going. Well, we have to begin with the soul, capital S. And in talking about it, we must realize that we use the terms entry and ensoulment only for clarity. Never has this cosmos been without a soul, nor whether it was there a time when body existed in the absence of soul, or when matter was without form. But in discussion we consider them separately. We can do that. For it's always legitimate when reasoning about any kind of composite to break it down in thought 
into parts, body and soul, matter form. Here's the truth of the matter. Were there no body, soul would not go forth, since there is no other place where it can exist according to its nature. Therefore, the nature of soul is to enter into bodies. Why? That's just where he's going now. It would go forth, right? If it would go forth, it must make a place for itself, thus a body. But the soul is at rest. Its rest is in repose itself. You know what it's like? It's like an enormous light whose radiance extending out to its term that becomes obscure. The soul sees this obscurity and gives it form since the obscurity is there as a substrate form. It were hardly fitting for what borders upon soul to be without reason to the degree that it must be capable of receiving. Right? To the degree that it must that it's capable of receiving duly in dimness in the in the shadows, it has thus uh, receives it. Now you know what? Uh, it is as if a, a fair and richly varied house were built which is not cut off wholly from its architect, yet to which he has not given a share of himself. He has considered it all everywhere as deserving of care, expending it and making it exist and in making it as beautiful as possible. His doing this occasions him not inconvenience because he manages everything with detachment. See, he's still attached to the house he's building. He's an architect. He takes care for every single piece. He watches over it. He brings it into existence. Hey, in this sort of way, the cosmos, the whole cosmos, gains its soul. It has a soul that does not belong to it, yet is present to it. It is not master, but mastered. Not possessor, but possessed. It's in the soul which bears it up and shares in it wholly cosmos is like a net thrown into the sea unable to make that in which it is its own already the sea is spread out and the net spreads with it as far as it can for no one for no one of its parts can be anywhere else than just where it is but because it has no size the soul's nature is sufficiently ample to contain the whole Cosmic body in one and the same grasp. Yeah. Wherever body extends, you know what? Their soul. If body did not exist, it would make no difference to the soul's size because soul is what it is. The cosmos extends as far as the soul sea goes. I was going to say seas. No. The boundaries of its existence are the point to which it's going forth. It has the soul to keep it in, in being. That's a good line. The shadow projected by the soul is coterminous with its expression, and this expression is that grandeur intended by its form. He does not make that clear until the next section, but it's worth looking at. Okay, now we're going into principles of midwifery, we can see right here, and then into theurgy in section 11. So, Barbara, who would you give the task of reading? Ten. Ten. Steven. <laughs> Good choice. Eleven? Ten. Ten. Can we do ten? Now, Mark, any place you want as we go on. Go ahead. 
Now we must return to the master idea that the universe is eternally what it is and grasp it in its entirety. In the groups, air, light, sun, and moon, light, sun, the members exist simultaneously, although having the degrees of primal, secondary, and deterritory. So let us also imagine the soul as eternally subsisting, and then the things that first come from it, and then those that come next. They are like the last weak flames of a fire, flickering of the ultimate intelligible fire that is the soul. Okay, that's the key analogy, right? Got it? Go ahead. Darkness <coughs> is lightened, and there is an idea as it were, hovering over death that is complete and ultimate darkness. This black shadowy depth is brought under the scheme of reason by the soul. The soul possesses within itself this rationalizing power. It is the same as with the seminal reasons that fashion and inform animals, which are thus like little worlds. What is in contact with the soul is fashioned in conformity with the characters that the substance of the soul naturally possesses. Okay, now, hold on to that last sentence, okay? The soul is fashioned in conformity with the characters that the substance of the soul naturally possesses. Right? Watch conformity and likeness play itself out. Go ahead. The soul acts without reflection and without pause for deliberation and examination. An action that was deliberate would not be a natural action, but would imply artifice. But art is subsequent to nature. It imitates nature and produces only imitations that are dim and evil. Toys they are, and worthless things, despite all the mechanisms involved in their production. The soul, by the power of its being, is master of bodies. It brings them into existence and leads them to what condition it pleases. And they have not, at the beginning, the power to oppose its will. Later, doubtless, they do hinder one another and thus fail to attain the, pro the shape proper to each that is intended by the seminal reasons of each of them. But at first the shape of the cosmos in its totality is the product of soul. All things come to be together effortlessly, effortlessly and with order. And the result, yeah. clashing with nothing else, is beautiful. Remember, all of this is capital S. That's world, <coughs> world soul. Keep going. There, the soul has constructed sanctuaries for divinities, domiciles for men, and other objects for other beings. What else should come from the soul? except things it has the power to make. Fire's power is to heat, that of another body is to chill. But the power of the soul is twofold, depending upon whether it exercises it upon something other or upon itself. The action of lifeless beings is in a way dormant when it remains enclosed within them. But when it is exercised upon something other, it renders that other, if amiable, like unto itself. It is a common characteristic of all active entities to draw others to a likeness of themselves. But the soul's action, even that which remains interior to it, is an alert as that which is at that as that which it exercises upon something other. Hence it gives life to things that of themselves do not possess life, and it makes them live a life like its own. Living in reason, it affords the body a reasonableness that is a reflection of that which it possesses. Everything it gives to body is an image of its life. It gives to bodies all the shapes of which it possesses the forms. It possesses the forms of the divinities as of everything else. Hence, it is that the cosmos contains all things. So what do you think of this line? The soul's action, even that which remains interior to it, 
is as alert as that which it exercises upon something other. Watch now. Hence it gives life to things that of themselves do not possess life, <clears throat> and it makes them live a life like its own. There's imitation, isn't it? There's a levels of imitation, levels of imitation, likenesses, right? through each level, right? Jump in. So, from what we've read, is it fair to say that the soul imparts shape, form, order, and reason to the cosmos? Mm -hmm. Without being the yeah. Yeah. Then, from last week, I believe you gave us an analogy of the soul being to the cosmos as our souls are to our beliefs, our fantasies. So, if that analogy is still true from last week, could the same things I just said be said of our soul and our beliefs and our fantasy? Well, there's something going on between each of these, isn't it? You're saying the same dynamic goes on. And the image is likeness. So the intelligence gives birth to the soul. It's like it. There's a likeness. There's a likeness. And since there is action involved, or doing, or making, then that likeness means that the principle behind this entire progression is all imitates its prior. But since it's an imitation, at each step you'll lose a level of significance. So, when we make things, that's, our, that's what we can do. We can make things. Lifeless things. See, we're at the end of the creative spectrum. Because everything above can give birth to something that has vitality and life and intelligence. We make Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, <clears throat> tables and chairs, lifeless things. But whatever we make is really must bear some likeness to its prior. You see, that's the principle. And you lose a level as you proceed downward. Now, if this is the case, something curious follows. See? Hence it gives life to things that of themselves do not possess life, and it makes them live a life like its own. Huh? So you can say, where shall I put that? And you can see where you can put it. And you can take the same idea and go lower or raise it a step higher. It's metaphysics. Jump in. But from the model you just drew, the model uh, on the blackboard you just drew, um, the principle of likeness supersedes it all. The principle of likeness supersedes all. Uh, is what? Supersedes is, it. It's at a higher level still. That's true. Than what you have there. No. Because without no. likeness, none of that would work. No, of course. Uh,
right, the supreme principle of all creation of any kind, well, of any kind, is like this. Because unless likeness existed, if the condition for likeness did not exist, there could never be any relationship between a model and a copy. For there to be model and copies wherever you have it, what does it presuppose? Likeness. Principle of likeness. Therefore, that's called the supreme originating principle of the entire cosmos. Now, if that is the case, where we have everything we need for theurgy and then astrology. So therefore, we need a volunteer to get into 11. I'm not actually, can I Hold ask it. a question first? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that this section would, would be, uh, this section would be midwifery oriented, so to speak. I'm not with you. Midwifery? Yes. Didn't you say midwifery is going yes. to be Yes, yes. Okay. Well, um, Would you not agree? Go ahead. Well, I saw an interesting quote, not only the one you were looking at, but what about the one on the other page? I do. It says, the soul acts without reflection in the beginning of that paragraph. That's this soul. The soul. Right. Yeah. But at the bottom it says, well, I mean, the contrast is with an action that was deliberate would not be a natural action but would, imp would imply artifice, but art is subsequent to nature. It imitates nature and produces only imitations that are dim and evil, T toys and worthless things. I wondered if that isn't a description of the actions of parents in forming their children. Their actions are deliberate, not spontaneous, in one sense at least. Right? And, and their, one of their primary purposes is to make them... Like. Like themselves. Yeah. No, no, okay. no, no. So, I would say, <laughs> So, uh, Pierre, one last question. My liver has a soul, correct? It's a body, and it has a soul that gives it its reasonableness and its intelligence to know what to do and so on down the line. <coughs> if I have your question, could you do it again to make sure Is I got liver? It? Does my liver have a soul that gives it intelligence and gives it reasonableness and gives it... If it never had a soul. Never had a soul. Wait a In this game, there's no such thing that never had a soul. Right. He says, if his liver ha Pardon me? has a soul. Um, do it again, please. No, no. no. My okay. liver has a soul. His liver has a soul. See if I agree. <laughs> <laughs> what? Thank you. No. And its various parts. Have a soul. See... Any particular organ, whatever it is, you can say, does it have some particular action or function? Does it appear to follow some model? Does it conform to what a liver should do or be? Right? And is its purpose to add some kind of benefit to the body itself. Health, if it's functioning properly. These are the kinds of things which for Plato and the Republic is a sign of the soul. Right? Because a particular action, function, and following a model shows there is some reason. <clears throat> now, Latinus calls two kinds of reason. This is kind of reason in nature, which he sometimes calls natural principles. But when these qualities operate in the mind, right, then we add to this same thing. We add reasoning. This it must do and function because the, the, within the organism itself it has these the potential motions built within it, we can make certain decisions and go this way and that. 
So if all the parts in the body are functioning ideally, then you can go out and drink. <laughs> Is that timing? Right? Then you're in good shape for a booze, right? Or, or, or anything else. Or you can end up doing nothing like Brad was doing. <clears throat> right? Were you trying to do nothing? Huh? I don't know. You don't know. I try to ask him and he always gives me a hard time. <laughs> no, no. By the way, are you doing something different here than you were doing there? Yes. Huh. Well, what were you doing there that you weren't doing here? I didn't have a green book. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it's fair, therefore, that Brad should read number 11? Yeah. Those ancient sages sought to obtain the presence of divine beings by erecting shrines and statues seemed to me to have showed insight into the nature of the universe. Go ahead. They have understood that it is <coughs> easy to attract the soul, but that it is especially easy to keep it by constructing an object disposed to undergo its influence and to receive from it a sharing. That's the principle, see? An object disposed to undergo its influence and to receive from it a sharing. Right. So, there must be some divine force then that brings, it goes all the way down to rock, stones, dress, etc. Objects. Go ahead. But the imaginative representation of a thing is always disposed to undergo the influence of its model. Like a mirror capable of catching the appearances. Nature, with the admirable skill, makes things after the image of beings whose forms it possesses. Thus, each <clears throat> form, form interior to matter, receiving a shape corresponding to a form that is superior to matter. Thus, every particular entity is linked to that divine being in whose likeness it is made. The divine principle which the soul contemplated and contains each in each productive act. Accordingly, it is impossible that there should be anything that does not participate in this divine being. But it is equally impossible... It didn't descend. Its influence spreads. And please... Thus, every particular entity is linked to that divine being in whose likeness it is made. See, we're going backwards now. See, we're going backwards. Back to the model. In whose likeness it is made, the divine principle which the soul contemplated and contained in each productive act. Now, we're going to go for metaphysical analogies. Right, he has to make that clear, and this is how he tries to push it. And this is somewhat akin, as he says later, to Anprocolis, to Apollo. Okay, go ahead. The son of that sphere, we return to our example, is the intelligence. And the soul immediately follows upon it and depends upon it, remaining in the intelligible realm quite as the intelligence itself. It accords the sun of the realm of sense in appropriate limits. It's it's appropriate. It's appropriate limits, sorry. But the soul's meditation it effects mediation. Mediation, I'm sorry. But the soul's mediation it affects the union between our sun and the intelligence. Yeah, by. By the sun. No. By the soul's mediation. <laughs> It affects the union between our sun and the intelligence. It is like an interpreter who conveys to the sun the wishes of the intelligence and to it the aspirations of the sun to the extent that it can attain to the intelligence by the mediation of its soul. Okay, look. 
Can you please work out the analogy now? <clears throat> As the sun is to, so too, <clears throat> the intelligence is to the soul. Therefore, the soul, what does it do? Come on, I need a quote. As it follows it and depends upon it. So, you could put here, soul is to light, or some planet, and as the planet circles around it, it follows it as it were, depends upon it, or light, I think light would make it closer. So the sun is to light, which follows the sun and has to move with the sun, it's dependent upon it. In the same way, he says the same thing, you now apply to the idea of intelligence and soul. There's a difference now, remember this is capital S. So therefore there's an intimate connection between these two. It's never separated, see? Now the question is, he has to go to a soul. By the soul's mediation, it affects the union between our son and the intelligence. See? There it is, see, there's a union here, see. <clears throat> And, of course, this is the famous analogy also in Plato, Book 7, at the end of an uh, allegory of the cave. We've got a, a mean analogy. Right. There is union in this, right? Here we go, right? For nothing is far away from anything else. These beings are divine because never separated from the intelligible. The link to the soul, capital, to that which in some fashion pro pro proceeds from the intelligence, right? So in some way, proceeds from it, generated from it, just as... <clears throat> And now we have a tough one. Okay? Let's take a little work. Therefore, who do you think should read it? Who do you recommend? I think Jack should be it. What'd she say? I didn't hear it either. Do you think? I think she said Daniel. Yeah. Did you say Daniel? I said Jack. Oh, you said Jack. I mean, oh. no wonder she passed it on to Daniel. Go ahead. Come on, Jack. Do you have it? <clears throat> okay. For nothing is far away from anything else. To be far away is to be different, and to be mingled with something different. There is union in this and their separation. These beings are divine because never separated from the intelligible. They are linked to the soul, to that which is in some fashion, or sorry, that which in some fashion proceeds from the intelligence. And by the soul, which makes them what they are truly called, they contemplate the intelligence towards which the soul exclusively directs its gaze. And the souls of men, they see their images as if in the mirror of Dionysus and come down in their level with a leap from above. 
They do not cut themselves off from their principles, which are, are the intelligences. And they do not descend with their intelligence. They descend to the earth, and their head remains fixed above the heavens. They have had to come down so low because their middle part is compelled to take care for that to which, as needed or needing their care, they have gone. But their father, Zeus, has pity on their fatigue. He makes the bonds in which they labor soluble by, by death and gives them a temporary rest in freeing them from their bodies in order that they may, they, they themselves, come into the intelligible. Most scholars are of the opinion that this is rare more than an, more than an example for Plotinus. The scho- oh, I'm reading a... Sorry, I have a printout. Is that a... Footnote. Footnote, sorry. So, oh, that's it then. Sorry. Can I share a I have a printout. Pardon me? I have a printout. So no, that was... No, no, no. Hmm. It's a little confusing. Sorry, and it's not formatted. Oh, no. Um. Yeah, nice footnote. I don't know where he got it, but I liked it. It's at the bottom of 140. Right here. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, yeah, he has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a more of a recent edition, mm. and therefore it's better. <laughs> <clears throat> Thus it is likely that one must interpret the following myth. Prometheus fashioned a woman and the other deities heaped gifts upon her. Aphrodite and the graces brought their gifts and other divine beings there. Turn the page. Turn the page? You skip 13 and most of 12. Go back. Oh, just because I wanted to get to the mythology? You don't think that's true, do you? believe at this point. <laughs> it's an intriguing section. Yeah. Okay, pick it up from there then, Barbara, okay? From 12? Where, where we should be. Well, Jack was reading. Jack, you're going to move. <coughs> oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. This is <coughs> okay, I see what happened then. Okay. Yeah. He makes, I'll start back on the other page. He makes the bonds in which they labor soluble by death and gives them a temporary rest in freeing them from their bodies in order that they may, they themselves, come into the (coughs) realm where eternally abides the soul without any turning toward the things of here below. The cosmos possesses all that it needs to be self-sufficient and always will. The limits of its duration are determined by unchanging forms. At the end of a given time, it always returns to the same state in the measured alteration of its cyclic lives. Oh, alternation of its cyclic lives. It leads the things of this realm to be one of, to be of one voice and one plan with the intelligible realm. All is determined by subjection to one single form. All is thereby regulated as well the descent as the ascent of souls and all things else. The proof of this lies in the accord that exists between souls and cosmic order. Their fortunes, their life experiences, their choosing and refusing are announced by patterns of stars. From this court concordance rises, as it were, one musical utterance. This could not be so if the, if the universe did not act in conformity with the intelligible realm and had not passions corresponding to the measured cycles of souls, to their ranks, and to their lives in the different sorts of careers that they carry out, whether in the intelligible realm, whether in the heavens, or whether they be, they be deflected toward this lower place. 
The intelligence itself remains holy and always upon high. There is no time when it departs from that to which it belongs. But, although holy, domiciled in the intelligible realm, it influences things here below through the mediation of the soul. The soul, placed most closely to it, is modified according to the form that it receives from it. The soul communicates this form to things that are its inferiors, sometimes in the same fashion, sometimes in a different fashion, depending upon the season, in a, an orderly changing course. The depth of the descent also will differ. Sometimes it is lower, sometimes less low. And this is so even in its entry into any given species. Each descends into a body made to receive it and conformed to its own inner disposition. Each is transported into the body with which it has the greatest resemblance. One to the body of a man, another into the body of a beast, for each one is different. The inescapable truth or inescapable rule of right consists in a, nat a natural principle that compels each soul to go according to its rank towards the image engendered and modeled on its own will and inner dispositions. All souls of this sort are close to that to which they are interiorly disposed. At the appropriate moment, there is no need of a being who will send or bring them at such time into particular bodies. The moment arrived, they descend more or descend there spontaneously and enter where they ought. To each its own time, and when that moment comes, the soul descends as at the cry of a herald and enters the appropriate body as though stirred and transported by a magic power of irresistible force. The governing of the living thing by the soul's works in the same way. At the appropriate time, it stirs and brings forth each part, sprouting of, a, of beard and horn, new impulses, new flowerings. The soul, oh sorry, new flowerings. The soul of a tree governs it, and every incident of its growth is according to a schedule determined in advance. Souls do not descend freely, nor are they sent. At least their willingness is not a free choice. They move towards bodies indeliberately, as if by instinct, as one is drawn without reflection towards marriage or sometimes towards the achieving of great deeds. Each particular being has its specific destiny and a moment, one now and one at another time. The intelligence, which is prior to the cosmos, has its destiny Two, to abide completely in the intelligible realm and to send forth its light, each ray, ray subject or subject to cosmic law. This cosmic law is innate in each soul and does not draw strength for its accomplishment with, from without. Given to individuals, each of them uses it and bears it without, within him, itself. When the moment comes, what it wills is done by the beings themselves in which it is. They are able to do so because the law, lodged within them, weighs upon them and gives them a painful longing to go there, whither they are bidden from within. Right. In a way, that's a philosophical description of the myth of Ur. That is how souls are, have a certain kind of status which they bring with them. And in the choice of the next life, there's a corresponding similarity between where the particular soul is, its past experiences, and that determines its reincarnation. But um, <clears throat> let me get, just for a moment, what do you do with this curious passage on uh, section 12? About ten lines from the top.
the proof of this lies in the accord that exists between souls and the cosmic order. <coughs> their fortunes, their life experiences, their choosing and refusing <coughs> are announced by the pattern of stars. From this concordance rises, as it were, one musical utterance. What is he describing there? Astrology. Astrology. What is it? Astrology. Astrology. Uh, the principles of astrology. Yes. <coughs> right. The same, but basically the same idea repeats itself. Yes. Likeness, patterns, forms. And if there's a similarity between the two, there's an easy access of the one to the other, and there's a kinship, and there's a communion, and so the process takes place. And that's also present in theurgy. Theurgy. So yeah. therefore, it's similar in that respect. Yeah, it is, because they both recognize the deity or deific forms in one way or the other. Yeah. Now about the cycles. Is that not also there? This could not be so if the universe did not act in, in conformity with the intelligible realm and had not passions corresponding to the measured cycles of souls, to their ranks, to their lives, and the different sorts of careers that they carry out. It doesn't matter where, in the intelligible realm or where else. Jump in. So that seems to imply that this destiny of souls is orderly. There's what? It, it, it seems to imply that the destiny of souls is orderly. Yes. It follows patterns. It follows the pattern. Patterns are are prescribed through astrology or in the heavens in the yeah. stars. Yeah. But there's a difference between destiny and fate. Right? Also, you are fated to carry out whatever model you, that you happen to have a similarity with. There's a pattern. So. Uh, on this level, see, if you go back and get familiar with Plato's myth of Ur, when the soul is ready to be reborn, right, all of the lots, all of the kinds of lives are laid out before the soul is ready for reincarnation or incarnation. Right? And the soul then has to pick one. That choice is based upon one's past life, the kind of learning one has brought with it. That is to say, the past experiences imprint on the soul, shape the soul, model the soul, and that makes it then receptive to picking out the next thing it needs to learn in the course of its existence. Right? Now look here, see. And then there's a, a daemon who's going to make damn sure that you don't deviate. Fate. Right, fate. And therefore, people then go through this, trapped in the various lives, depending upon their past lives and what they've learned. Except for, yeah, go ahead. It, it seems to me that the implication is that the imprint or the imprinting of the soul, that process, only occurs during incarnation, not in the spaces between the incarnation. Not in the spaces between them? Yeah. I don't know what that means. Um, no, no, try. Come on. What I'm trying to say is, is that it seems to me that when the soul is receptive to these imprints, to the Yes, changes, the soul is receptive depending upon its past. Right, but its it, choice, therefore, is in a large degree determined by its past, and it chooses the next life in order to challenge that kind or add to that kind of learning. But that doesn't seem to occur in between lives, in between incarnations. Yes, th that takes place in between. That's right. So if so, that's right. then only change can occur to the soul when they're down here incarnated. If I'm right. Someone want to say the same thing in another way, Barbara? Could you help out? Nancy? 
the soul can only change by being in a body. Yes. Yes. Isn't that peculiar? That's very odd. Uh, that aren't we changed by our experiences? The more profound, the more so. But I think you may be pointing to something else. See, there's something strange about those. This, see, then that starts a cycle. You've inherited that model and you live out your life. Then you go back, pick out another one, live out your life. It goes on and on and on, endlessly. There's only one way out, but I forget what that is. <laughs> but people familiar with Mithavur know it. Do you know the Mithavur? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's, what's the way out then? That also is a part I don't remember. <laughs> no. Okay. You have in life? Okay. Right. Is there times when the soul is not incarnated? Pierre, please. There's a question. I didn't. Pardon me. Is there a time when the soul is not in a body? Does it go from body to body? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when you drop dead. <laughs> According to this man. Yeah, 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 yeah. But when you, mm -hmm. yeah. what did you think of his answer? Yeah. Also, in a uh, certain question. psychic states, you might separate the soul from the body. What's that? I said there are also states of mind in this game of the separation of the soul from the body. And that too is a death, since death is described as the separation of the soul from the body, is it not? Mm -hmm. Well, you can either wait until you drop dead or do it before, and then you might get a picture of what death is really like. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it adds to your ability to talk about it, too. I think. We went when we checked. <laughs> is that true, Miss? Yes. Yeah, she said yes. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Jackie be agreeable. That's why I call it Jackie Virtue, right? She agree only when she thinks it's right. Yes. I don't know about that. <laughs> that was a good thing. Okay, what I'd like to do now, come on. Is um, we need um, thirteen and fourteen, but Please, 14. It's very short. You have to do some homework to see. You should be able to write me a, a little paragraph or page or two pages on Plotinus's understanding of the myth of Prometheus. Okay. Right? He's now using the Prometheus legend in a certain way. You should be able to see it and describe it and then look it up on some other source. Best source, of course, is uh, Hesiod, or some other popular work of less significance. I'm volunteering to read it. Yes, please. Hence it is that our world is brightened by a great number of lights and adorning itself with all these souls. From the moment of its primal organization, it accepts unto itself like multiple worlds gifts from the intelligences and the deities who confer souls upon it. Thus it is likely that one must <coughs> the following myth. Prometheus fashioned a woman and the other deities heaped gifts upon her. Aphrodite and the Graces brought their gifts and the other divine beings theirs, and they called her Pandora because she had received gifts, and because all she had received gifts, Dora, and because all Pan had given them. All the deities accordingly gave a gift to this being fashioned by Prometheus, who represents providence. And Prometheus' refusal of these gifts, what does it signify except that it is better to choose the intellectual life? But the creator of Pandora himself is bound, because he is in some sense the captive of his creation. Such a binding comes from without. His release by Hercules tells us that there is power in Prometheus, so that he need not remain in bonds. Whatever one thinks of this interpretation, the myth certainly signifies the divine gift of souls that introduces them into the world. And it fits in with our thesis. Thank you. Okay, so next time we'll hear 
We'll have a uh, coffee and discussion on the nature of Plotinus's understanding of the myth of Prometheus and what you think of it. Oh, did he do these things? Yes. Yes. So far. Yeah. So he is a very interesting thinker, philosopher, isn't he? Yes. <coughs> and we need this. Anybody bring uh, dialogues of Plato with them? Oh, yeah, I think you have. <laughs> He's got a copy. Yeah. 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 Okay, 67, 67B. What do you make of this one paragraph? And is not purification really that which has been mentioned so often in our discussion to separate as far as possible the soul from the body and to accustom it to collect itself together out of the body in every part and to dwell alone by itself as far as it can both at the present and in the future being freed from the body as if from a prison uh, is not this called death the freeing and separation of the soul from the body is that a yoga that description is that a yoga practice no. Okay, see you next time. Simon's twins have one soul. Wow, dude. The question whether or not have different minds. That's the question, you see. The soul connected to the mind or connected to the personality is connected to the body. There's nothing about the body. Yeah. <laughs>